becoming and building a house of rest. That's the message, and this is actually a theme. Okay, so I'll be sharing on this for the for a little while because I believe this is the season. This is the message for this season, right? This is the message for 2020, 2021. I believe God has allowed the shaking to happen because He wants His people to become and then to build a house of rest. Before we can build a house of rest, we have to become a house of rest, a person of rest. So Matthew 8, verse 23. Matthew 8, 23. And then we're going to read a bit further on to verse 28, 29. Matthew 8, 23. When he got into a boat, the disciples followed him. Okay, that's a good reminder there. To always follow the Lord, follow his presence, follow his peace. Follow his leading. He was ahead of them and they followed him. Verse 24 And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea so that the boat was covered with waves, but he was asleep. Okay. So the tempest, the storm, did not keep him from sleeping. Verse 25 Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us. We are perishing. Verse 26 But he said to them, why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was great calm. Okay, now let's go on to verse 27. And the men marveled, saying, Who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? Verse 28. When he had come to the other side, the country of Gergas Thines, there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce, so that no one could pass that way. And suddenly they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, Son of God? Have you come to torment us before time? Now, why I stop here at verse 29 to show you the link between verse 28 and verse 24. Verse 28 says, When he had come to the other side of the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two demon possessed men coming out of the tombs. And here's the interesting phrase exceedingly fierce. Doesn't that sound like the storm? The storm was exceedingly fierce. Verse 24. Matthew 24 says, Suddenly a great tempest arose. A fierce storm. Perhaps that storm was stirred up by the demons in those two men. Right? And just as the storm came suddenly, verse 29 says, Suddenly they cried out. Saying. So they knew, the demons know where Jesus is going. And sometimes, the presence of God will provoke a reaction from the enemy. Because the enemy knows what's coming up. And so the world has been in a storm. Perhaps because the enemy knows what's coming up. Our mighty great harvest is about to happen. And so the enemy is trying to derail the church. So many have faced uh, personal storms, corporate storms. Obviously, obviously, the corporate storm is the pandemic, triggered by the pandemic, which has affected economies and, and other things, corporately, companies, ministries, personal issues. But what is our response and why has God allowed this? Um, let's look at Luke 17. There's two books after Matthew, Mark, Luke. Chapter 17, verse 26. Okay, Luke 17, verse 26 says, And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. And remember what Noah means, right? Noah means rest. As it was in the days of rest of Noah, in his time, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. Verse 27. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Now, did you see when did the flood come? The day that Noah entered the ark. Verse 28, likewise, it was also in the days of Lot. They ate, they drank, they bought, they said, they, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, then it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Verse 30, even so it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Right. So here the question is, the world is in a storm, many believers are in a storm. What is God's expectation of his people? 
He wants us, as he asks the question in Isaiah 16, who, where, who's going to build him a house of rest? But before he can build the Lord a house of rest, he has to become a person of rest, a person at peace. Right? And, uh, and the very first time the house of God is mentioned in Genesis 28, remember the story of the pillow? Jacob had to take that stone he slept on, pour oil, and became a pillar, and said, this is the house of God. The rock that represents the house of God was a pillow of rest. And, uh, and we see that Jesus is going to come back just as the floods came and Sodom was destroyed suddenly. Until that time, life will carry on as usual. So we have hope that it will come back to normal. It will be so normal that no one will expect his coming. If it was not normal, everybody will be ready for his coming, right? Before the floods came, it wasn't rolling thunder, darkness for days and weeks and months. I'm sure, everyone would believe no one. But it wasn't stormy and dark and foreboding. Just life as normal. And nobody believed no one. Life as normal, nobody believed Lord. Life was so normal. But here we're having a trial run, so to speak. Because in this pandemic, in the shaking of the pandemic, which came suddenly, like the days of Noah, suddenly out of the blue, right, early last year, life was normal. Suddenly, life changed. God is saying, look, it is time for my people to become a house of rest. And this is where the disciples failed. You know, they were all in the same boat. You see, sometimes we receive a lie from the enemy. If we have problems, God is not with us. The disciples, they didn't have the problem. The Lord was with them and they still had a storm. So don't receive the lie of the enemy. It's just because you have challenges that the Lord is not with you. He is with you. His presence doesn't mean you won't have problems. But His presence means you can enter His rest. And the disciples failed this test. They failed to enter His rest. So it was just like what Jesus told the disciples in Luke 10. Verse 5 and 6. Whatever house you enter, first say, what? Peace to this house. Don't say Suramakan. Okay. Peace to this house. Release your peace. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return. So how many of you know that peace was in the boat? But unfortunately, there were no sons of peace there for his peace to rest upon. The disciples were there, but they failed to enter his rest. So the rest of God is not based on, hey, where's, where's the Lord? He's there, but we need to enter in. That's why Hebrew says, labor to enter. You know how many know, remember Matthew 5, 9, the Beatitude. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. That's why the Lord said, if the son of peace is there in the house, your peace will rest. So our job, our responsibility is to become sons and daughters of peace. So that the peace of God can rest upon us. Peace of God can rest upon us. So how do we enter his rest? Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 says, verse 3, For we who have believed do enter that rest. The disciples did not believe. So they failed to enter the rest that Jesus was in. Jesus was resting in the boat, but they were not. And it was their job to enter into that same rest, to be at peace. So how do we enter into his rest? Hebrews 4, 3 says, and remember, what day is today? The seventh day of the seventh of the week and of the month. God is speaking to us about the rest, the Sabbath rest. You know why? Because too many Christians don't realize the importance of praying and interceding from His rest to have authority. Can you imagine if the disciples, in their panic and fear, kept rebuking the storm? Would anything happen? And there are many believers like that. They're speaking to the storm, peace, peace, but they're shaking and trembling at the same time. Hey, oh God, if the storm is getting worse, stop, stop, stop. In Jesus' name, I rebuke you. Yeah. You've got to be at peace for your words to carry authority. You've got to enter his rest. It's not prayer. It's not a magic wand. You've got to come from his presence at the place of rest. So Hebrews 4, 3 says, we who have believed enter their rest. You know why many don't believe? Because we assume God is not with us. You see, the Lord is not with us. That's why all these problems. How many people have said that, right? See, God is not with us. That's why Malaysia got all the problems. That's why the government got all the problems. God is not with our country. No. The disciples couldn't say that because they saw Jesus. They knew Jesus was there. So Hebrews 4, 3 says, He who believe enter the rest, as he has said, I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished. Verse 6, Therefore it remains that some must enter in, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. 
disobedience to belief, disobedience to trust. Now I want to show you an interesting um, description of Solomon. Anyone know what Solomon means? The name Solomon? Go to, if you can, I'll read the verse 1 Chronicles 22 9. Why God used Solomon to build a house, not his father David? 1 Chronicles 22 verse 9 says, Behold, a son shall be born to you. Speaking of Solomon will be born, who shall be a man of rest. And I will give him rest from all his enemies all around, and his name shall be Solomon, for I will give him peace and quietness to Israel in his days. Isn't that amazing? So Solomon really speaks of peace and rest. And that's why God chose Solomon to build him a house. Because God builds his house on peacemakers. On those because you say peace, shall to the house. You know, Proverbs 16, 7 says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. That's why God bless Solomon. Because the man of peace, even his enemies were at peace with him. Acts chapter 7, verse 47 says, Solomon built him a house. Now you know why. Because Solomon was a man of peace. Verse 48. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. As the prophet says, verse 49, Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What house would you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? You see, we have N-O, no rest, there will be N-O, peace. And if there's no peace, we will have fear and no spiritual authority. But if we K-N-O-W, rest, you will K-N-O-W, peace. And we can speak peace with authority without fear. So N-O rest, N-O peace, K-N-O-W rest, K-N-O-W peace. And that's the difference between authority and no authority in our prayers. This is very important because many of us, many Christians are praying and we wonder why are things getting worse? Why is the storm getting worse? God, we are praying so much, but how are you praying is the question. Are you praying with faith? Are you praying with rest? Are you praying distracted by what the enemy is doing? Are you entering into the rest of the Lord? Because houses of rest are built by sons and daughters of peace. So we want to build God the house we're looking for. Remember Psalm 127 one says, unless the Lord builds the house, we never be able to build it. We are the house of God. We've got to build ourselves in his rest so that we can build those around us. Houses of rest are built by those in peace. Peacemakers. That's why peacemakers, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be sons. Become sons and daughters of peace to build this house. Why do we need to become a house of rest? Because the shaking has started like now before and it's going to come in waves, different waves. Matthew 24 says, before the Lord returns, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, walls and rumors of walls, the love of many will grow cold. So things will be shaken. What will happen if you're not building a house of rest? If you're not a person of rest, we'll have no hope. We came into the darkness. So God is using this time of shaking as a wake up call to his people to become a person of peace, to become a house of rest. So they can build a house of rest. Because remember, when will the Lord return? As it was in the days of Noah and Lot. Now it's interesting, you know, two quite similar but not similar. How were they similar? Um, they were both chosen by the Lord. Right? In a way, they were sons of peace. Noah means rest. And in Noah's case, his wife and children, unlike the disciples of the boat with Jesus, they all believed. They all entered Noah's rest and they were all safe in the ark. Right? The disciples didn't believe the Lord. They all panicked, stressed, fear, and it got worse, so they had to wake him up. But in Lot's case, unlike Noah, no one really believed him. They had to drag his two daughters. The son and the, the daughter's husbands or fiancés didn't believe. Even the wife disobeyed, turned back, and became a pillar of salt. So although Lot was chosen like Noah, one had a family that entered distress, the other didn't. But, but the first responsibility for you and me is to become the Noahs and Lots when the Lord returns. So that we can be an example of God's peace and God's rest. See, we are both to be like the Noah and the family of Noah. We are to be like the Lot and the family that Lot should have had. Didn't. Okay, remember the 12 tribes during the Passover? The head of each house was the son of peace. 
that all those who were in the house of rest were protected and the angel of death passed over. Okay, and it's not just men, but even Rahab when Jericho was destroyed, she was like the woman of peace, the daughter of peace, that all those who believed her word were saved in the house of rest on the walls of Jericho. Even Zacchaeus, you know, he climbed up the tree, Jesus invited himself to Zacchaeus' house, he came under conviction, and Jesus said salvation has come to his house, because his family entered into his rest. Philippine jailer. See, possessing our inheritance comes, happens in his rest. Remember when Jacob had the dream under the open heaven? And the Lord said, in this land in which you lie, I have given you an inheritance. Okay, if we want to receive what God has for us, the nations, Psalm 2, 8, ask of me, I'll give you the nations, the inheritance. We've got to abide in the church. Because what God has for us doesn't come by striving, struggling. Remember, it's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. So I'm going to just read one more passage of scripture before. Uh, maybe two. Joshua 1 8. I'm sure you're all familiar with this, right? Be strong. Have a good courage. You know, the biggest, greatest weapon of the enemy this season is fear. Do you agree? Too many Christians are just like the world, full of fear, like the disciples. Right? The disciples were full of fear. Though they were with Jesus, though they were the presence of the Lord, though they've seen the miracles, they're still afraid. They thought they're all going to die by drowning. They forgot everything Jesus had said. And so the storm is getting worse. Because like the disciples of Jesus, they're doing a lot of praying, but praying out of fear. They're not at peace, they're not at rest. They're trying everything. Instead of entering this rest, they're giving themselves more work. I just pray longer, pray harder, I just do more. I just march around your house seven times, march around the city. Do more activity. It's not by might, it's not by power. We need to go to sleep like Jesus. And then when you rest, wake up, speak in calm, speak peace. Just stop boom, with the word. But we replace activity for rest. And this is the work mindset of many believers. If I just work harder, do more, God will give me. No, no, no. God is waiting for you to stop your works and enter His. Stop striving in your own good ideas and enter His peace. And take a stretch. Joshua chapter 1, verse 6. And this is the word of the Lord. When we, we need to enter the rest of God, why? Because so Joshua 1, 6 says, Be strong and have a good courage, for to this people, there are many people depending upon your peace. The people you influence, your friends, the people you lead, you pray with, you share with. You are called to be the Rahab in that house, the Joshua, the Noah, the Lot, the man of peace in your house. In your sphere of influence. Be strong and have good courage, for to these people you should divide an inheritance. So God's inheritance to his people has to begin with a son or daughter of peace, one who's entered his rest. Be strong and have good courage. Why? For to these people. Verse 7. Be strong and very courageous that you, not just the people's sake, but your sake, that you may observe to do all that is Moses was commanded, not to turn to the left or the right that you may prosper wherever you go. So be strong and courageous for your own prosperity's sake. How? Enter his rest. Become a son and daughter of peace. No rest, no peace, no protection, no provision. Be strong and very courageous that you may obey. In verse 13, Joshua 1, 13. Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, the Lord your God is giving you rest and giving you this land. No rest, no inheritance. Verse 15, Joshua 1 15, until the Lord has given your brethren rest as he gave you, and they also have taken possession of the land. You see the link between rest and possession, rest and inheritance. God's inheritance doesn't come by striving or fighting for, it comes by entering his rest. The Lord has given your brethren rest as he gave you, that they also have taken possession of the land which the Lord your God has given them. Verse 18, Joshua 1, 18. Whoever rebels against the command and does not heed your words, in all that you command them shall be put to death. Only be strong and of good courage for the rebellious sake, for those who will not obey. Don't let them distract you. Okay? And that's a big weapon, another big weapon of the enemy. What are the two greatest weapons of the enemy? Fear, by being distracted by the storm, and 
distraction by the rebels, especially in government. Ah, yeah, the politicians are today. Hey, you know, I just wondered, sometimes uh, what happens in the government is a very exciting reality show. People watch the government like they watch TV. You know, I was looking, thinking about the New Testament, and you wonder how much did Jesus and his disciples talk about the going on the government in the time. They didn't realize every leader, every word of every leader, what the Romans were doing. Is there much discussion? No. You see, Jesus and his disciples were not distracted by what the government was doing or what God was saying. And too many believers today are distracted by what is happening around them, but they're not focused. We can be distracted by the pandemic to cause fear, or we can be distracted by the rebels to distract us from our focus and entering the church. What is distracting you? Well, how is the enemy distracting us, the church? Do not be moved by what the government is doing. What is our job with government? One Timothy to in everything, but first and foremost, in all supplication, prayer, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for kings and all in authority. Full stop. Not record, listen, read every word they say, everything they do, every act they do, and then fight with each other. Why they did this? Why they said that? Hey, that's not our job. Just pray for them. Don't worry about all the details. That's a distraction. Anything more is a distraction. Don't let the end the government rob your peace. That's why you can't enter the rest. The enemy successfully distracted so many believers to rob their peace because they're distracted by what the government's doing. Or what this person is saying, or what that person is doing, or what this person is there. Hey, Jesus did not minister in reaction to the enemy. He did not minister in reaction to all the bad news. He ministered in response to the Father's witness. So what was the problem with the disciples in the boat? They were distracted by the storm. Why did Peter sink in the water? He was distracted by the storm. Why are many Christians sinking? Because they're distracted by the storm. Is Jesus with us? Yes, he is. But he's asleep in the boat. He wants you to enter it. Dress. You see, right in the beginning, the first verse of the house of the Lord, Genesis 28, 13. Behold, the Lord stood above the, the, the ladder, the open heaven, and he told Jacob, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie on, I will give to you and your descendants. If we can't lie in rest, you can't give us a land. See, many times we think what we need, we have to fight for, but we forget that it comes from his rest. That's what Zechariah 4 6 says. Not by mind, not by power, not by all your fasting and praying. Yes, good to fast and pray, but don't pray out of fear and distress. Pray in distress. And how did, how did Jesus stop the storm? By speaking to the storm. Because Mark, speak to the mountain. Right? Speak to your mountain, speak to your personal storm, whether it's personal, whether it's corporate. But first, you've got to enter his rest. So, how do you know you're entering his rest? There's a decrease of fear and an increase of peace. As long as there's fear in your life about the problem, you have no authority to speak with. Fear robs our authority. Many Christians are substituting prayer to being at peace. They're praying without peace. They're praying full of fear. Second Peter, chapter 3, talked about why this is so important in preparation. This, as I said, is a practice run for when Jesus returns. Okay, why is it a practice run? The pandemic is a practice run because suddenly, the pandemic came suddenly, Noah's flood came suddenly, Jesus will come suddenly. Nobody expected it. And the only way to protect ourselves to be, to be ready when he comes is, have we built a house of rest? Because only when the ark was complete, then the flood came. When Lord left Sodom, then Sodom was destroyed. So when will the Lord come? When, he's, when we have built for him a house of rest. So we are holding back the coming of the Lord. Because God doesn't want to bring people to a house full of strife. That's why the constant struggle with building the house of God. Because most houses are not a house of rest. People come and go. What? Second Peter. Chapter 3. Verse 10 to 14. Talked about the coming of the Lord. And the need for rest. Second Peter. Okay. Chapter 3. Verse 10. Okay, to Peter, to the end of your New Testament, this, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. 
verse 11. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Verse 12, looking for and hastening, don't delay, hasten the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Verse 13, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, in which righteousness dwells. And this is the key verse 14. Therefore, because of all these earlier verses, therefore, beloved, looking towards Looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace. And you know how what's going to come ahead. Make sure you're found by him in peace without spot and blameless. So, so be a bride of peace, a daughter of peace with a bride without spot and blemish. So here are the two great priorities. To be at peace, which means what? Be free from strife. Be free from offense, be free from fear. These are all the enemies of peace. You know how the enemy will try to rob you of peace? Through offense, through strife, through fear. And if you can rob you of peace, you've lost your authority. Now, you can pray all day, he's not impressed. Nothing is happening. A lot of Christians pray with offense, pray with fear, pray with strife, and they wonder why their prayers are not heard. Keep yourself in peace, number two. Holiness without spot and blemish. Be careful the temptations. Now, these are the two great temptations of the enemy that many believers come under. To rob their peace, set them out of holiness and purity. Last verse, one verse, Hebrews 12, 14. Close Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Pursue peace with all men and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Hebrews 12, 14. Pursue peace with all men and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. You say, but how to pursue peace with all men and our ways peace of God to make even your enemies fear? Why is peace so important? No peace, no authority. No peace, no rest. So when the shaking comes, you'll be shaken to the rest of the world. It is our responsibility to build the Lord and act like God did. To be the leader like Lord was. Unfortunately, his family didn't believe him. But if we are not the Noahs and the Lots and the Rahabs, how are people going to be saved? They need someone to connect with, to the man of peace, the daughter of peace. See, before we can build God a house of peace, we have to become one ourselves. And how do we become one? Guard against distraction. Not against offense, against strife, against fear. Remember that the Lord is with you. No matter what you're going through, His presence is there. You have to enter it through faith. Enter it. Keep your focus. Guard your focus. In Colossians 3 says, Let the peace of God rule your heart. Let it rule. You've got to be your leader. King Peace, that's his name. Jehovah. Shalom. Melchizedek, King of Salem. Salem comes from Shalom. Shalom. You've got to be our leader, our ruler. Don't do anything that you don't have peace. The God of peace shall crush Satan under your feet. Why your feet? For whether you're not baptized. What's the armor of God? Put on the shoes of peace. Is your walk led by peace or fear? Are, you, are we making decisions out of fear and stress and pressure? Or is the peace of God directing our steps and our choices? So peace has got to be in our feet to direct our walk. Peace has got to guard our hearts. And when we become blessed as the peacemakers, for they shall be sons of God. And when we enter his rest and his peace, now we are positioned to step into our inheritance. And now we are positioned to attract those who need the Noahs, the Lots, the Rahabs, the Zacchaeuses, the Philippine jailer to be the anchor. And then your family, to you, to all of you here, you're in a position of leadership in your house, you are that anchor, you are that Rahab, you are that. Noah, to all those who look to you, who, who respect you, who are, who are whom you influence, for their sake, for the people's sake, be the person of peace. Okay, so this is this is the this is the message for the season, really building a house of rest. That's why God is shaking because you know why? If there's no shaking, you will assume we are at rest. You're not at rest. 
Is it resting in good circumstances? Right? Many people think they, are, they, they have the joy of the Lord. No, they have happiness from happenings. That's the difference between hap happiness and joy. Happiness is based on happenings, happy happenings. Joy comes from the presence of the Lord. And sometimes if there's no shaking, you think the joy and your peace is from the Lord, no, it's from your circumstances. So until circumstances are shaking, you do not know your foundation. See, until the storm came, the disciples thought, wow, you know, they're walking in God's peace. No, they're walking in peace because no storm. Only when the storm came, they realized their peace wasn't from the Lord, but was from circumstances. So God is allowing the shaking to reveal the foundation of many Christians. So that they'll wake up and say, I need to start becoming the man of peace, the daughter of peace. To become the house of rest. To build the house of rest. That's the house that God is looking for. For the days when the Son of Man comes. To be like the days of Lord. To be like the days of Lord. So we have to guard our hearts from fear. Guard our hearts from strife. Don't, don't pick, you know, it's like, it's so sad that, that Jesus did not, you realize this, Jesus did not chase after the scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees. He didn't go looking for that. Hey, hey, you come here. Let's have a debate. I know you don't like me. Huh? Can we have an argument? I'm going to email you Instagram, Facebook. Bum, bum, bum. You said this, you did that. He didn't waste his time with them. They came to him and then he come for them. But he didn't go looking for them. Too many Christians are chasing after the victim. They're taking unnecessary battles. They're fighting unnecessary. The enemy is distracting them from their assignment because they don't know their assignment. Don't waste time being distracted. Guard your heart. Guard the peace of God in your heart so that there'll be authority when you pray. So that you can speak to the storm, like speaking to the mountain. So that you can say shalom. Why? Because you have, you're abiding in shalom. So remember, the Lord is coming. Souls are at stake. Okay? Souls are at stake. God needs before the final harvest, before he returns, he needs a house of rest. And he's looking to us. You see? That's why I'm allowing the shaking. Too many, many, very few have got the message. They're trying to do more works. Right? They're trying to do more works. They said, look, it doesn't matter whether your storm is big or small. You know, some people say, no, it's not equal. You know, some have got some part, some have got been a little bit shift. Some of the storm is not so bad. It depends where in the ocean you are. Look. The main difference is, is Jesus in your boat? Better to have Jesus in a sampan than no Jesus in the Titanic, then you get an ice boat. It doesn't matter what your circle, how rich you are. Okay, it doesn't matter. Your wealth cannot buy you what only Jesus can bring you. Right? At the end of the day, is the Lord in a boat? And if he is, the word of God says he is, and you're experiencing problems, that means you need to enter into rest. You need to deliver yourselves from fear. Yeah. The guard against you. Don't be distracted. Oh, the numbers going higher every day. I saw looking at the numbers. Somebody, somebody, I remember years ago, asked this young guy, you know, this youth, in his teens or twenties, uh, how, how, many, how many people uh, you, you, you preach to or in your church? He said, oh, brother, I left a book of numbers long time ago. Now it's a book of X. <laughs> okay. It's not about the numbers of COVID. It's about entering his rest. Don't be distracted by the numbers. The numbers are misleading. Numbers are misleading. Gideon learned the hard way. Lord, I have 32,000. Okay, Gideon, too much. Huh? Then not get down to 300. 32,000, we put down to 300. Many people say, ah, the book of Acts. Huh? You see, when the Holy Spirit came, they only from 120, and then they grew to 3,000, and then they grew to 5,000, uh, but they forgot, hello, when Jesus started in Matthew, there were 5,000 men before anything happened. He broke bread and, and fed the 5,000 men, excluding women and children. So back to square one. Right? From 133,000, 5,000, 5,000 is what Jesus started with at the beginning of his ministry. Where were all the rest? You would think it would be many times more after Jesus rose from the dead, you know, did all the miracles. Where are the crowds? Numbers can be misleading. Right? Aren't you glad that we don't have parenting seminars based on how many children somebody has? And our speaker for today's parenting course has 12 children. That's why I'm going to him. Okay? Okay? We're not experts on parenting because we have. So many children. It's the health of our kids. It's the character. It's not that we can multiply. Go in vitro, you can have you know, quadruplets. It's not that. Yes, God wants many. So he wants souls saved. But at the end of the day, we are not made disciples. We're going to fall away. Narrow is the gate that leads to life. Narrow is the gate that leads to his presence. And so the key is as we close. Yes, as believers, Jesus is in us. But not many are in him. And so to enter his rest, you've got to abide in him. Abide in his presence. Abide in his word. Abide in his peace. 
put him on, put on the garment of praise, put on the garment of salvation. Let him turn your walls of prison into walls of salvation. Live in gratitude, live in thanksgiving, live in praise. You know what, when you start to thank and praise God, I just reminded of the lion, you know, if you say he's a lion of the tribe of Judah. What's Judah speak of? Praise. But guess what? The righteous are bold as a lion. But don't forget what tribe the lion is from. If you're not a man of praise, you have no boldness. You can't separate boldness to deal with fear and, and not living in thanksgiving and praise. To be righteous as a lion, to be bold as a lion, you've got to praise from the tribe of Judah. Be a person of praise. Because praise shifts your focus from what the enemy is doing to what the Lord is doing. Guide your focus and we will overcome. Amen. Let's stand together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord, for your grace. We thank you for your peace, for your shalom. And each home represented here this morning, we thank you for giving us ears to hear your voice, that we will understand the time and season, Lord, that you're allowing the shaking, Lord, that your house will become a house of rest, that you may build upon your sons and daughters to be sons and daughters of peace, to become a house of rest ourselves, that we can say shalom in our home. We thank you, Lord, that you will not be moved, Forgive us and protect us from being distracted by the enemy. Guard our hearts, Lord. Let your peace guard and rule our hearts. We thank you, Lord, for the authority that comes from your rest. So let your kingdom come, Father. Let your will be done, Lord. We speak shalom over Penang, over Malaysia, over every storm, every mountain before us. Speak peace in your presence, Lord. Teach us how to abide in your presence, how to abide in your rest, Lord. Thank you, we praise you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen.